How's it going and welcome to my guide on running the grand finale of this epic campaign. There's a lot of twists and a lot of turns all throughout this module, but without a shadow of a doubt, the most memorable thing coming out from both you and your players is going to be this epic conclusion to this campaign. Before I go into any names and obviously anything of any significant note, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So players, if you don't want the awesome ending to be spoiled, then kindly and politely go away. But DMs, let's go ahead and dive right into what makes this ending so great and how we can make it even better. So this is it. This is our battlefield for the epic conclusion of this campaign. We've got lava, we've got tentacles, we've got platforms that players can't easily get to. There's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of things to take into consideration because throughout the course of this battle, there are things happening on outside of initiative counts, uh, like initiative count 20. We've got a whole bunch of legendary actions, a whole bunch of legendary resistances, a whole bunch of spells, a whole bunch of things that there is, you know, keeping track of as a DM. And my oh my, is it worth it to read up and learn what there is going to be happening here. The only way your players are getting to this location is by putting all six skeleton keys into the skeleton gate up here and making their way down the stairs. However, what's interesting to note is once the skeleton gate opens, it doesn't state anything about closing again. It doesn't state anything about closing behind them. Uh, so you really have to take that into consideration of do you want to lock your players into this epic last fight? Or do you want to leave them with the option to run up and down the stairs? If you have a ranged group, you players might get a little cheeky and decide to run down the stairs, shoot at something, and then run back. Which could certainly be pretty annoying. Um, but that is something you have to consider if you allow the gate to be open. If you have a more martially inclined group, a more melee heavy group, you're probably not going to have to worry about that too much. Because they are going to be getting up into the face of the action and dealing with the Soulmonger, dealing with the Atropol, and then eventually dealing with Aserarak himself. So what do your players see when they actually get in here? They're going to spot several things. One, they're going to spot that there is three other balconies, uh, however there's no way to walk to them. Uh, very important to remember is the fact that these are not traversable ledges right here along the edges. That's just a way to show you that it's you know slanted down and goes all the way down to the lava pit below. So the only way your players are going to be able to get to the ledges of the phylacteries and the ledge with the portal at the end is if they have either teleportation, or they can run along walls, or they can fly. So your players make it in here and they see all these things, what do they do? Well, that really comes down to if you have the Atropole immediately pull aggro or not. I would strongly recommend that you don't have the Atropole seemingly just attack anybody at random because why would it attack anybody at random? It is simply just sitting here and nursing, and it is clear that people regularly come in here. A Sarak occasionally checks up on the Atropole. The Sone Sisters occasionally come in here and make sure nothing's going on, and they take a soul or two from the Soulmonger. So why would the Atropole go ahead and just immediately attack someone? And that can give your players a lot of opportunity to study what's going on here. They can see the Soulmonger, and they can see the souls of everyone that's died floating in here. They can see the Atropole is clearly feeding off of this thing as it's got an umbilical cord attached to this thing. They can see that there's a whole bunch of weird urns and items and all these things on these balconies. And they can also see that there's a portal at the other side. If you allow your players the ability to explore around, that can really lead to an awesome encounter where they say, Hey look, we know we gotta you know, fight the Atropole, we, gotta, we know we gotta fight this Soulmonger. What if we set up strategically all around the balconies and set up all around here? And then when the time comes to, they're spread all about and then initiative kicks off and then the crazy shenanigans happen. This also allows the ability for your players to actually, if they want to, skip the Soulmonger and the Atropole and go ahead and go into the portal. And if they go into the portal, lo and behold, they can find out what's going on here. They can see all these Nothics along the wall. They can find this soul bag that's filled with potentially one of their friends. They could even explore around a little bit and maybe even say, hey, you know, after seeing that Atropole, I'm not, I don't like the look of that. Maybe we just go ahead and dip out of here. 
Uh, having that option is a great way to see where your players' allegiances and where their uh, loyalty lies if they're willing to fight the Atropol and destroy the Soulmonger. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into some of the stats of the things that are going on around here. Per example being the Soulmonger. The Soulmonger, this giant capsule that's uh, in the middle of these adamantine struts, it has an AC of 15 and 200 HP, vulnerability to radiant damage, immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Uh, more often than not, most DMs are, you know, nice and give most groups plus one weapons at this point. But if you don't like the idea of weapons being able to do that, maybe you give it resistance to any type of bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, magical be damned. We have the adamantine struts, which are AC 20, 100 hit points, immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, and immunity to fire, poison, and psychic damage. Makes sense. Uh, once again, if this thing is destroyed, then it's bad news bears. And especially because if for some reason there's combat going on, and your players are all, you know, tight roping this thing on the beams, and they're on the middle of the lava pool, and the beam snaps, lo and behold, they're going to dive headfirst in the lava. And lava is really bad because you take a damage immediately when you fall in it, and you take damage at the start of your turn. So it is almost a guaranteed way to have a dead PC on your hands. And last for this little section here, we have the tentacles, which once per turn, as a response to someone making an attack against the Soulmonger, can go ahead and either whack someone for a decent amount of damage, 48 plus 6. But that is not at all even comparable to the more damaging thing here, which is instead of dealing damage, the tentacle can grapple someone. And when it grapples someone, it lifts them above the lava and drops them below. So, the 4d8 plus 6 damage of just whapping someone, or the damage of 10d10 fire damage as they fall into it, and thus are probably going to start their turn in it, taking another 10d10 points of fire damage. It seems far more reasonable that if something wanted to kill you, it wouldn't just punch you, it would drop you into lava. However, the countermeasure to this is the fact that the tentacle is not truly that powerful. At least, not as powerful as it can only lift up 330 pounds. So, so if you're running this purely by the book, rules as written, I would strongly recommend that you go ahead and look at your player's character sheets before this fight and see how much their character weighs in addition to all of the gear that they are wearing. Because if you have, you know, that big old heavy goliath, that's huge, you know, seven foot tall, 300 pounds of muscle, and he's carrying, you know, 80 pounds of gear, then it makes sense that the tentacle can't grab him. But it totally makes sense that the tentacle would be able to grab that little gnome wizard that's only carrying 20 pounds of gear. But that is just how the Soulmonger operates in combat. The real thing we got to look at is when combat starts, that's when the Atropol is going to be coming in here. Whether the group attacks the Soulmonger or the group attacks the Atropol, that is when the Atropol is going to be going ahead and start doing some massive work here. Let's go ahead and dive right into what makes the Atropol so disgusting. So first off, looking at the stats of the Atropol, its mental and physical stat lines are pretty freaking good, except for its decks, of course, but who needs decks these days? The thing about it is, it has 225 HP, a pretty huge chunk of HP. And we'll see in a moment here that throughout the course of the fight, it actually can regain HP. This thing has magical resistance, meaning any spell anybody throws at the party, this thing's rolling advantage on. This thing has a negative energy aura, which means anybody within 30 feet of the Atropol cannot regain HP. And any creature that starts a turn within 30 feet of the Atropol takes 3d6 necrotic damage. That is a really big deal. This thing is doing damage, and if someone's looking low on HP, and they try to slap their buddy with some heals and it doesn't work, they're going to be pretty pissed off and really sad that the uh, effect didn't go through. I cannot tell you which way you should run the negative energy aura, either telling your players that, it, that they can regain HP or not. If you're running a hardcore game, then go ahead and by all means, uh, don't tell them until they use the heal and then it's gone. But if you're running one of those more pulpy and exciting adventure campaigns, and maybe you don't want to earn the ire of your players, 
I would go ahead and tell them that if they are within 30 feet of the Atropol, they feel like, you know, nothing they could possibly do could get their health back and sort of allude to the fact that they cannot heal because, like I said, wasting a whole turn just trying to heal someone and it doesn't work, that sucks. In addition, of course, the fact that that 3d6 points of necrotic damage is a pretty big deal. It's not much damage in the grand scheme of things. At this point in the game, they should be a level 11 by the time they fight this thing, at the bare minimum. But 3d6 is going to add up because it's hitting everybody that's starting within 30 feet, meaning that if you have a group of four and they're all getting hit, that is 12d6 points of damage spread all around. And they're also going to be getting hit by other things. The Ash Ball is going to be swinging. The Soulmonger is going to try and be grabbing people. And all this is weakening them up for the true final fight of a Sarak. And last we have a turn resistant aura, which basically states that anybody within 30 feet has advantage on being turned from the undead. So this creature is listed as being a undead. Uh, sub subtitle a uh, Titan, but that doesn't really matter. So this thing theoretically can be turned by your clerics and by those special paladins. The thing about it is though, it has a plus nine to its wisdom saving throw and at advantage, meaning Far more than likely, if someone tries to turn this thing, it is going to go ahead and resist it. There is, of course, the very, very slight chance that it does fail, and thus it is very sad. But it still has other things it can be doing in the meantime. Like, for example, these legendary actions. For the legendary actions table, we have a three simple uh, actions this thing can take. The first one being touch, which only costs one action, and the actual makes it a touch attack. Let's go ahead and take a look at what a touch attack is. A plus 9 to hit, dealing 3d6 points of necrotic damage. Uh, not really too much. Uh, that's kind of wussy stuff there. It's kind of weak. But hey, damage is damage. Uh, and theoretically can be doing this you know, four times throughout the course of a single turn. So more damage being piled on top of the negative aura, aura stuff. Next up we have Ray of Cold, which cost two actions and it casts the Ray of Cold which this one has a plus 12 to hit, dealing 6d6 cold damage. The plus 12 to hit is far more likely to hit than the plus 9 to hit, and is doing twice as much damage. Very scary stuff. And if this thing sees that someone's concentrating on a spell somewhere, it is definitely going to go ahead and try and snipe that person and do a ton of damage to make them lose their concentration. And last, and without a shadow of a doubt, the unleashed least action here, the whale coming in at costing three actions every creature within 120 feet must make a dc 19 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion this is the biggest one this is the scariest one the deadliest one and the most awesome one if you are running a game where you know exhaustion almost never comes up and people are going to say exhaustion what, what even is that then you're gonna have to bust out the tomes to see what exhaustion does Level 1 Exhaustion is no big deal at all. You only get disadvantage on your ability checks. It is everything after level 1 Exhaustion is when it's going to really start hurting your players. At 2 levels of Exhaustion, we can see that your speed is halved. Meaning that those people that are running around, zipping all over the place, they are going to be doing so far less. And that is really sad. The third level of exhaustion is disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws. That right there is the tipping point of your best people are all of a sudden just miserable. They're failing all the saving throws that are being thrown at them. They're missing way more often because they're rolling a whole bunch of dice and keep on rolling one, twos, and threes. Really, really scary stuff. And that is when your players are going to start the downward spiral of death. Next up we have 4, which is your hit point maximum is halved. How this works is, uh, for example, if you have a character with 100 HP and you are th somehow throughout this entire Archibald fight doing perfectly fine, but you're getting hit by this thing, your hit point maximum all of a sudden shifts all the way down to 50, and for the remainder as you have this exhaustion, your health is now going to be at max 50, but more than likely you're going to be taking damage and you're going to be dropping more in HP. At number 5 exhaustion, we have speed reduced to 0. If you are basically on the adamantine struts and someone screams and you go down to 5, 
then lo and behold, you are too weak to carry on and have to sit there. Really, really scary stuff. And last and certainly not least, we have level 6 exhaustion is death. So, if you let your players in on the, you know, the exhaustion table and they know what is at stake here, they realize that if this thing continues to wail, it will kill people on average in 6 rounds. This thing, if it does this, more often than not, people are going to fail. A DC-19 constitution saving throw is realistically only savable by the people that have proficiency in it and the people that have a very high con, such as the people that are wearing the amulet of health and the people that are basically in inhabited by Unk. So does the Atropol use the whale every single turn? That is certainly something a lot of DMs kind of uh, jump back and forth on. I'm going to tell you, though, if the Atropol has the choice between touching someone three times or doing a ray of cold one time and then touching someone or wailing and hitting everyone, wailing just seems far more reasonable to do. It's hitting everyone, it's making everyone worse, and realistically, uh, wailing on people is going to kill them way quicker than just touching them. So it makes sense that this thing is wailing every single round. However, if you do this every single round, then you have to realize that the Atropol's action economy is lowered because it is not getting any other legendary actions. Uh, it is not hitting people as much. But the whale is just so effective. And most important of all, even if the Atropol fails and doesn't kill the players, they are probably more than likely going to be so weakened by this that when a Sarek shows up, he is going to easily dunk on the party. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the actions here. We, of course, have the touch. You know, n nothing really big here. We have the Ray of Cold. You know, pretty nice. It's good for sniping those people in the back. But we have the Life Drain. The actual targets one creature within 120 feet, and the creature must make a DC 19 Constitution saving throw or take 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save or have as much on a success. The Atropol regains HP equal to half the amount of damage dealt. I'm going to tell you, on its turn, there is no reason why it would ever use a touch or a ray of cold when it can life drain someone. It makes no sense. The only reason the Atropol would ever use a touch or a ray of cold is as a legendary action. The life drain is just way too big uh, because one, it does way more damage and two, it also heals. Like I said, the Atropol is smart. This thing has a 25 intelligence, a plus 7, and has a 19 wisdom. This thing is way more intelligent than anyone in your party, and more than likely it's going to be more wise than anyone in your party. So this thing does know that, you know, oh hey, this person's really good at con saves. I'm not going to target that person with the life drain. I'm going to target the person that is weak to the con saves, like that wizard in the back. Like that druid who is just uh, casting the sunbeams in the back. It is going to life drain effectively here. And like I said, this thing's going to be targeting the people that are concentrating on stuff. Because if someone takes 8d8 necrotic damage and they take 36 uh, points of damage in total, then their con saving throw to maintain concentration is going to be pretty big. It's going to be, for this instance, 18, a DC of 18. So th this play this thing smart because playing this thing dumb does a pretty much disservice to your players. And lastly, for actions here, we have Summon Wraith, a recharge of six. Uh, so this one is pretty great. Uh, this is It's definitely going to summon at least one Wraith, because on this first turn, it, it will just go ahead and summon the Wraith for free. And the Wraith being added to the fight is huge. If the Wraith gets summoned where all the casters are, and all the melee guys are already up close to the Soulmonger and to the Atropol, then all of a sudden a Wraith is in, right next to the Wizard and the Ranger that's shooting the bows and stuff. Having the Wraith there just as a disruption is a big deal. The Wraith is going to be hitting people and doing damage. It is going to be draining the life of the people. And it's just going to add another body to the fight. And as we all know, adding more bodies to a fight makes fights just that much more deadly. That being said, though, it is a recharge of six. And thus is very unlikely to ever get used again. Because hopefully your players can deal with this thing in the span of six rounds. Uh, on average, you know. But let's say you do roll a six at the start of your turn. Would the Atropol actually summon another Wraith? Uh, possibly. If it if it's digging a lot of damage, it probably does want to life drain someone just to get that more HP back. 
But if it's not taking that much damage, it probably is going to go ahead and try and summon another Wraith. Because uh, if you are lucky and the Wraith gets in when there's another Wraith, then having two Wraiths and the Atropole and the Soulmonger in the fight is a tremendous deal. So your players are forced to fight the Atropole and the Soulmonger and however many Wraiths show up during this fight. And my oh my, is this going to be an intense fight. They've got to worry about not falling into the lava. they got to worry about all the wailing and all the, the draining of the health and the lack of healing if they're close to the Atropole and all the constant damage and, you know, just all these variables. There's a lot to think about. Uh, in, which is great because the more complex a fight is, honestly, the more you know intriguing it is. Um, so definitely keep a lot of these things in mind. If they're walking along the beam, uh, the steel beams, and take damage, you got to remember that they got to make a deck saving throw to stay, see if they still you know stand on there. You got to remember that if they are within 30 feet, that they're not healing, and more importantly, at the start of their turns, they're taking damage. You gotta remember if you aren't wailing to use the legendary actions accordingly throughout the course of the initiative that it strikes at key times and is going to try and disrupt anybody concentrating on spells because lo and behold anybody concentrating on spell is probably doing some you know something important but this is the key pivotal moment of the entire campaign are your players going to destroy the soulmonger first or are they going to destroy the atropole first Obviously, it just makes sense that they would attack the Atropole because the Atropole is attacking them. But there's a reason why they are here. There's a reason why the world is in peril. And it's not necessarily the Atropole's fault. It is the Soulmonger. The Soulmonger, that device, this large tube, is the thing that is gathering all the souls in the world and thus is getting them consumed. If your players make the true and honest sacrifice to destroy the Soulmonger first in the course of the fight before destroying the Atropole, you should reward them. Uh, we will be getting to that in a moment. But, basically, if they destroy the Soulmonger, what you should reward them with is a Resurrection. And I will have a big ol' spiel about that later on. However, if your players decide to go for the more practical approach and destroy the creature that's attacking them, this undead Atropole, and ultimately cause it to fall, that is when Uncle Aserak is going to get the bad news that his son has died and is going to teleport right up in this fight. And that is when the fight is going to get even more crazy than it already is. Aserak is going to show up on that balcony, look around, and see all the horrible people who have undone his great work and is going to reap their immortal souls. Basically what this means is at literally the second the Atropole dies, you're going to have a Serac roll initiative here and join in the fray. And my oh my is that going to create a absolute commotion. When he shows up, he's actually accompanied by a Sphere of Annihilation, which we'll be getting into in a moment. The important thing about this though, is when a Serac shows up, anybody inhabited by one of the Trickster God spirits is going to all of a sudden feel their rage. Anybody that is inhabited by a trickster god who didn't eat uh, from that buffet earlier is going to gain 50 temp HP every single round at the start of their turns and deal an extra 3d6 psychic damage whenever they hit a Sararak. That is a pretty huge buff. Uh, 50 temp HP uh, every single round means, you know, air quo free HP. Something you gotta remember though, temp HP is not real HP. If you are... It doesn't heal you, it basically go. it's a buffer outside of your HP, and thus you cannot heal it, you cannot gain more of it. If you already had a little bit of temp HP, then it just only goes up to 50. You cannot stack it anymore, so it's, it's going to cap at 50. Uh, very important things to remember. But, my oh my, is 50 temp HP every round a tremendous deal. So how is the Sarak going to deal with a whole bunch of people that just killed his baby and are gaining 50 temp HP every round? Well, surprising to say, he actually has a way to deal with it. First off, his AC natively is 21. And because he is a bright wizard, he is not a dumb person by any means, he has shield prepared, meaning that at any given point throughout the entire fight, meaning that his AC natively can be 26. That is really hard for a lot of people to hit. At this point in the game, you have level 11 PCs, 
they probably have anywhere between a plus 8 to a plus uh, 11 to hit. That's still really freaking hard to hit this guy. And mind you, he's, already, he's on the far side of this balcony, and he's got a lot of other tricks up of his sleeve. Hopefully, every single one of your PCs has both a Trickster God and didn't have their powers basically removed uh, from eating from the feast earlier. But, even still, even if everyone still has all of this temp HP and all of their hero powers and stuff, that probably isn't going to amount to much because they presumably have spent a decent amount of resources uh, de tackling the Atropole. Dealing with this thing's a pretty big deal. I mean, like, having to fight the Atropole, you're going to be losing a bunch of health, you're going to be using up spell slots, and you're going to be using up your class resources. And thus, by the time a Sarak shows up, your players are probably already going to be a little bit depleted. And it doesn't even help with the fact that a Sarak shows up and he is full up. And if you thought the Atropole had a big health pool, that's nothing compared to a Sarak. He has 285 HP. This guy's a monster. <laughs> I mean, he is, he is a pretty big deal. He is like the second most famous and most powerful Lich in all of the multiverse. So it makes sense that this guy's pretty freaking powerful deal. He's got a long list of resistances and immunities and condition immunities and all this great jazz. He's got true sight to out to 120 feet. His passive perception is 22. He's going to be looking around. He's going to be able to spot everyone. He is going to be able to take a bunch of damage. He's going to be able to deflect a lot of blows because of his high AC. And even if people do do damage to him, lo and behold, he's got so much HP, it doesn't even matter. Let's go ahead and take a look at his equipment list here. He carries the Staff of the Forgotten One, and he wears a Talisman of the Sphere. Two very big items here, and we'll get to that right now. The Staff of the Forgotten One is just that. It's a staff of some old Archmage that no one remembers. But man, oh man, is this thing powerful. It doubles your Intelligence Arcana and Intelligence History checks. It prevents you from being blind and charmed a whole bunch of this and a whole bunch of that. It lets you control undead. It lets you basically wield it as a plus three quarter staff that does an additional 3d6 points of necrotic damage. But none of that really is a big deal. The real big deal is the fact that he can invoke a curse. A Sarak can point to any one person and they must make a DC 23 constitution saving throw or be cursed. While cursed in this way, the target can't regain HP and most important of all has vulnerability to necrotic damage. So, your players are getting all jacked up, but they probably can't heal half the time because they, they're sticking close to the Atropole. Atropole finally goes down, alright, I'm going to finally slap you with some spells. Aserak's going to look around and be like, no, you're not healing. Because, once again, more often than not, most people cannot even succeed a DC 23 constitution saving throw, even if they roll a nat 20. More often than not, most people only have got either a plus 1 or a plus 2 to their con. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a huge deal. Even if they are proficient with it, even if they have a semi-decent one, a DC 23 is a hard one to beat. And they, are, they no longer can get healed, meaning that they're just a ticking time bomb of death. And a Sarak knows that that person is vulnerable to necrotic damage. So they pop that necrotic spell, and they're taking double. Huge stuff. If your players for some reason get the bright idea to try and disarm Sarak and steal the Staff of the Forgotten One, they're going to be in for a rough time because this thing doesn't like other people. There is a 50% chance that this thing tries to take over the wielder of the staff. The wielder must succeed a DC 20 charisma saving throw or be possessed and becoming an NPC under the DM's control. That is a huge deal. It's a straight up coin flip uh, if they are going to be taken over. And then it's a DC 20 charisma saving throw, which once again, more often than not, most people are not going to be able to succeed on that. And then they just lose their character mid-fight. That is really scary stuff. It's even more terrifying is the fact that there is a destroying the staff clause. A creature in control of the staff can go ahead and snap it against their knee or against the solid surface. And everything within 30 foot radius has to make a DC 18 dexterity saving throw or take 24 d10 force damage. My, oh my. There is very few PCs who will be able to survive this considering that they'll be damaged already and there's no way that their health pool is that big even with the 50 temp HP. Uh, so, 
So if for some reason Cyrax feeling very, very vindictive, or more importantly, uh, the players get the bright idea to go ahead and snap the their staff and say, screw you, Cyrax, uh, then bad things are going to happen to him. His other namesake item is the Talisman of the Sphere. This essentially what it what it does is it allows him to move the sphere uh, without question and no one can interfere with a sphere. More often than not, most people haven't played with a sphere of annihilation, so let's go ahead and look at what that does. The sphere of annihilation basically is a small little two foot ball which someone can control and move around. This thing basically eats whatever it touches, but for things that it doesn't consume whole, it does 4d10 points of force damage. Meaning that, realistically, a Cerec doesn't have any need to uh, try and you know play dodgeball with the players with this thing. But, uh, it can be useful for destroying certain magical effects, or it can be used for destroying the environment around them. Like, let's say your players are still on the Iron Struts, the, and a Cerec can go ahead and just destroy the Iron Strut, and cause them to fall in the lava. Aserak has three legendary resistances a day, meaning that if he fails something, he can say, no, I'm not failing that. But he has a plus 15 to his intelligence saving throw, a plus 12 to his wisdom saving throw, and a plus 5 to his charisma saving throw, and he's immune to a lot of effects. Meaning that more often than not, you're not going to have to worry about using those resistances. He also has turn resistance, which once again, uh, he has advantage on his uh, saving throws against being turned. But thankfully, he's got a plus 12 to his wisdom saving throw, so hopefully he shouldn't get turned because that nothing would be more sad than having the big bad all of a sudden get scared. For legendary actions here, we have at-will spells. Sarah can cast one of his at-will spells. Now, you might be thinking, oh, a cantrip? Eh, that's whatever. But there's two things to consider. One, a Sarah's cantrips do four dice of whatever the cantrip is, meaning that a Sarah the cantrips do four dice of whatever the damage is, so Shagging Grasp is 48 Lightning, Ray of Frost is 48 Cold. But that's not the real thing here. The real thing is that Aserak is such a powerful wizard that level 1, 2, and 3 spells are at will for him. Think about that. Level 1, 2, and 3 spells are at will. Huge deal. For the second legendary action, we have Melee Attack. He can use a Paralyzing Touch or one Melee Attack with a Staff. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. The Paralyzing Touch is a plus 8 to hit, only does 3d6 cold damage, whatever. But the target must make a DC 20 constitution saving throw or be paralyzed for one minute. And they can repeat this at the end of their turn. If a Sararak hits someone with this and they are paralyzed and they have a bad con save, they're more than likely going to be out of the fight until, you know, a Sararak decides to kill them. Uh, but it's only a plus 8 to hit, so the AC junkies are going to have a little bit of a better time with this. The other attack we have here is the Quarter Staff, which is a plus 11 to hit, which only does 1d6 plus 4 one-handed or 1d8 plus 4 two-handed, but also deals an additional 3d6 necrotic damage. Not bad. Uh, I'm going to say, though, that Aserak would probably want to Paralyzing Touch people because uh, doing a little bit of damage isn't that big of a deal. Paralyzing people, that is massive. If he paralyzes just one of the PCs, their combat effectiveness goes down significantly. Next up we have the Frightening Gaze, which is two actions, and a Sarah can look at someone within 10 feet of him, and the creature must make a DC 20 Wisdom saving throw, or they are frightened for one minute, meaning that they can't get closer, meaning that they have disadvantage while within sight of a Sarah And that is a big deal because, once again, a Sarah is smart. He is going to look around and say, see that, oh, you know, that dumb barbarian, oh, that guy's not wise. Oh, that, you know, that stupid fighter over there, he's not wise. And he's going to use this to his advantage. Another two action, we have a Talisman of the Sphere, which allows the Sarak to move the, the orb basically uh, 90 feet. A pretty significant deal, this orb just basically flies across the battlefield and he can have it slam into anybody anywhere. But once again, this is really not necessarily about the damage. The damage is only a piddly 4d10 points of damage, big deal. More than likely, a Cyrak is going to use the sphere to disrupt the environment or destroy some type of spell or some type of effect the players have put up. And last and certainly not least for his legendary actions, we have Disrupt Life. Each creature within 20 feet of a Cyrak must make a DC 20 con saving throw 
or take 12d6 necrotic damage or have as much as a failed one. This pairs in so well with his curse because he hits one person with a curse here, one person with a curse there. Then all of a sudden, that 12d6 points of damage, only 42 points of damage on average, that all of a sudden gets bumped up to 84 points of damage on average. That is tremendous. You know, you, your players might be thinking to themselves, 50 temp HP every turn? We got this. But you start thinking about stuff like that, where Acerak is dealing all this damage, that 50 temp HP is going out the window. And lastly here, let's go ahead and take a look at the spell list. We've got uh, some damaging cantrips. We've got shield, ray of sickness, arcane lock and knock, and you know, really, really uh, techy stuff here. We have counter spell, really, really good if you're if a Sarak is going up against a huge uh, caster build. We have blight, ice storm, phantasmal killer, cloud kill. You know, we have all these things. Uh, my personal favorite in here is a circle of death, a really big one because of course necrotic damage. Finger of Death, really big one. Uh, his, his DC is 23, so some people just straight up cannot succeed on it. And you'll note here that for his 8th and ninth level spells, he is so powerful, he has two slots of them. Two slots of Power Word Kill and Time Stop, that is massive. Right from the get-go, he could just snap his fingers and Time Stop and manipulate the battlefield so as he desires, then sets it back up to normal and maybe teleports around or maybe gets away from like a certain type of fight somewhere and then he you know resumes time and he's all of a sudden somewhere else and he's about to cast a massive spell on someone the other thing to consider is the fact that if your group has people that are below 100 hp temp hp be damned he can just straight up say die and they die <laughs> really really scary stuff I'm going to tell you, uh, this spell list is totally awesome and is perfectly fine to run as written, but really something to consider is the fact that this book came out before Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This book came out before there was a whole bunch of spells that a Sarek might always have in his back pocket. A Sarek seems like the kind of person that would have Abby Dalzim's Horde Wilting in his pocket. Uh, a Sarek would definitely seem like the kind of person who would have Toll of the Dead as a cantrip, because Toll of the Dead is totally awesome, you know, uh, that'd be 40, 12 points of damage, and some people straight up would not be able to succeed on that Wisdom saving throw. So if you like the look of a Sarax spell list, then go ahead and keep it as is. It works perfectly fine. But if you like the idea of expanding his spell list out some more, if you think that he deserves more spells, then go ahead and add some, because, like I said, it was invented before uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything came out. So let's go ahead and take a snapshot of what this fight is going to look like. Your players walk down the stairs and they see the Soulmonger and they see the Atropol. If the Atropol immediately starts combat, then they're probably going to go ahead and be forced to rush forward onto the beams and try and fight this thing. And that is going to be terrifying because as they rush onto the steel beams, the tentacles are going to go ahead and uh, get ready to slap. But of course, the Atropol is getting ready to shoot out its various things, and a Wraith is going to spawn. That Wraith is going to disrupt the party, the group is going to be bouncing on these beams, and the Atropol is going to be wailing, and it's going to go ahead and try and suck the life force out of anybody nearby. It occasionally will go ahead and shoot out rays of cold at people all around, and maybe even try and touch people and try and shove them into the lava. Your players decide, hey, we need to get rid of this Atropol ASAP, let's go ahead and pour everything into it. They trade resources and eventually knock down the Atropol. A Sarak shows up, and a Sarak is not going to play nice. A Sarak is going to go ahead and be popping off spells left, right, and center. He's going to be invoking curses because time is in his favor. The players are losing resources. A Sarak is not losing that many resources. A Sarak is going to be invoking curses left and right. That is going to be preventing healing and is going to be building up all those vulnerabilities to necrotic damage which he's going to start dumping on the party left right and center if some way somehow your players make their way over to a Sarak's ledge a Sarak is not going to just sit there and just take melee hits for no reason a Sarak is going to cast maze on the dumb barbarian that is hacking away at him a Sarak will teleport to the other side of the room and thus make people waste their time trying to get all the way back a Sarek is going to play this intelligently because if you play a Sarek unintelligent like if you have a Sarek just sit there and let people wail on him once again you're doing a disservice to the namesake of a Sarek by just letting him be melee bait 
when he is a wizard. No wizard's going to sit there and just let themselves get attacked. That's silly. I'm going to tell you right now, if you run the Atropel purely as written, and if you run a Sarak purely as written, you run this thing purely as written, and you run them as intelligent as they should be, your players are going to die. But the thing is, is death doesn't have to be the end of the adventure. It really doesn't. One thing you should consider is the fact that if your players destroy the Soulmonger before destroying the Atropel and thus getting killed by a Sarak, they will have saved the world. If your players fight the Atropel and then get into a fight with a Sarak, and even when they're fighting a Sarak, they still decide to destroy the Soulmonger, then still props to them. That's a big F you to a Sarak, middle fingers raised as they destroy that thing. That is climactic and super epic and should be rewarded. However, if your players do not do anything in regards of destroying the Soulmonger, then unfortunately that is their downfall and that is their wrongdoing for not putting the emphasis on saving the world at hand. If your players destroy the Soulmonger, then I strongly recommend you have the true ultimate ending backed up and ready. For this ending, I'm going to go ahead and leave a big old uh, text blog in the description here of what it's all about. But what essentially comes down to is your players destroy the Soulmonger and they either get killed by an Atropel or by a Serac. And your players die, their souls drifting off to whatever, you know, wherever their souls may belong to, either the Hells or the Great Beyond or whatever deity they've assigned themselves to. But then they find themselves pulled back to reality, where lo and behold, Syndra Sylvain resurrected the party for the extremely hefty price of 25,000 gold each. That is a true ending to a campaign. Your players save the world and make the ultimate sacrifice, but then all of a sudden get brought back to life. That is, you know, tearjerker. That is, that is a true epic conclusion to an awesome campaign. And that is definitely something you should take into consideration. If you definitely think that some people would uh, appreciate being dead more, then go ahead and say, hey, you've got the choice of being brought back to life or not. Because who knows, maybe that paladin really, really wants to, you know, hang out with his god. Maybe that person that sold their soul to a devil somewhere thinks that hell could be a cool little adventure. Who knows? But having that alternate ending where your players save the world and get to live in the world that they saved is truly a promising reward. So what happens if your players don't destroy the Soulmonger? Your players sadly go up against the Atropel and they either get killed by the Atropel itself or get killed by a Sarak soon after. What happens? Well, if they don't kill the Atropel, and then it's still going to be business as usual. A Serac will go ahead and uh, keep the place running and probably set up more and more elaborate traps because, hey, someone finally made it to the very end. But if you still really want this adventure to continue on, then go ahead and have a new group of adventurers that uh, basically just came in right after the PCs make their way down here and try again. Maybe the Atch Ball is a little bit weaker this time. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there's some new conditions to this place. Maybe there's some tomb dwarfs that are doing some repairs around here. Maybe Withers is down here overseeing construction. Uh, maybe change of the variables. But if you really want to run this battle again, I would strongly recommend that you have different variables uh, thrown in here. If your players did kill the Atropel, but did not kill the Soulmonger, then Aseric is going to be furious. Uh, he has the Soulmonger, which can go ahead and collect all the souls of everyone in the world. But sadly, his dead baby god is, you know, is dead. He can't use it anymore. So what's Aseric going to do? Well, Aseric is probably going to go ahead and, you know, cook up some elaborate scheme. But he likes the Soulmonger. So he might just go ahead and uh, turn off the Soulmonger and leave it for another day. Maybe your players do air quo succeed, but only for a little bit of time. I would always recommend that you never sugarcoat things for your players. If they did fail, then they should be ramifications of failing, but maybe have it be present in your future campaigns where the Soulmonger's effect still lingers on. Or maybe, you know, some 
groups just come in here at the last second once again and are come in and destroy the soulmonger. Uh, a lot of different ways you can run that. And lastly here, the very unlikely scenario where your players actually succeed. They destroy the soulmonger, they destroy the Atropol, and they actually cause a Sarek to retreat. Uh, very unlikely, but it's technically possible. If you if your players are creative and you're unlucky and they're very lucky, anything can happen. Your players, they get to gloat over the fact that they destroyed the Soulmonger and saved the world. They killed a Titan, they sent a Sarak packing, and they get to walk out with their lives. At that point, they are going to go ahead and go through the portal. Then they are going to go ahead and toss a bead into the Black Goop and thus make themselves free as they get out of the tomb where lo and behold they'll get to gather all the treasures that they've garnered throughout this entire tomb and meet up with all the friends and foes that they met along the way i i've definitely heard a lot of people uh continuing on with this adventure afterwards but i don't think there's any way you can ever top off this fight really I would strongly recommend that if your players win or lose, uh, make their way through this fight, that this should probably be the end. Because, you know, it says in the book that Fenthaza is going to go ahead and ambush the group as soon as they make their way out of the tomb. That would suck to, you know, fight through all this, be super weak, super hammered, and then all of a sudden Fenthaza shows up with a whole bunch of you on T and says, yeah, we're going to kill you now. Like, that sucks. Really. So, I would strongly recommend that your players succeed, uh, they make their way out of the tomb, then you just go ahead and time skip uh, as the group makes their way back all the way to Port Nanzaru. And that's the campaign! Uh, this is, like I said, this is an amazing campaign, amazing climax here, just all, all this crazy fight, and should your players, you know, destroy the Soulmonger, they've, they've saved the world. It, there's a lot of modules, a lot of campaigns where your group only gets to affect, you know, small little regions or maybe does shape the world in some way. But this is without a doubt a truly world-changing event. Everyone that ever died is currently dying again. And more importantly, no one can ever get brought back to life. So that really changes a lot of the aspects of D&D, &D, of no one being able to be resurrected. Uh, there's a ton of adventures that have been resurrected and, of course, I'm assuming in future campaigns, you're going to have players die and be brought back to life. So like I said, if the Soulmonger doesn't die, the Atchwell doesn't die, maybe keep those ramifications for future campaigns to some degree. Maybe not, you know, fully to that degree. Maybe death saves get a little bit harder. Maybe you can only be brought back so many times. Maybe something along those lines. But definitely change things up uh, for the better or for the worse. But really have a continued story and really make this uh, lasting effect shine. And that's that. I really hope you and your players have an uh, awesome experience with this epic conclusion. Uh, win or lose. Uh, <laughs> because it certainly can go any which way. Like I've said, I've ran it multiple times and I've seen this go a lot of different ways. Make sure you have your own spin on this fight and make sure that your players get a truly unique experience and aren't shortchanged by DM Fiat. That's going to wrap it up for me. Go ahead and tell me your awesome stories about what you plan to do to this fight and what happens throughout this fight for your groups because I, I'm just trying to think of all the crazy stuff I saw. Uh, there was, I had a Sarak uh, basically paralyze someone and because they, they were the only person on the balcony. And so a Sarak paralyzed them and then a Sarak pushed them into the lava. Could you imagine being paralyzed and then getting shoved into lava? What a terrible way to go. Well, that's going to do it for this video. Uh, thank you all for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.